Hi, Bookstory viewers. I'm Gabriel Hunter Chang. I'm a digital media assistant at Backstory. Uh, today, we are here with Liza Featherstone. She is a journalist and a contributing editor at The Nation. She is also the author of Divining Desire, Focus Groups and the Culture of Consultation. So I was going to give a synopsis of the book, but I think that we would all be better served if I let Liza do it. Um, so Liza, what is the culture of consultation and what is the role of focus groups in that? So. The culture of consultation is something um, that um, I have come to understand um, as um, the, uh, the, the state of affairs by which um, we the people are constantly consulted um, about um, everything. Um, the, the mouthwash we use, um, the, um, the healthcare policy we live under, um, the um, the advertisements we watch on TV, whether the movies um, we go to see in the theater are happy or sad, um, such a wide range of experience, and um, and we are consulted about those things um, through um, in in many ways um, through surveys um, and um, more recently through um, data mining uh, on social media, but focus groups have been um, one of the enduring um, methods um, that, um, that have been used um, to um, find out um, how we think and feel about things um, since the middle of last century. Um, and, um, um, and because um, this culture of consultation um, has, has been so persistent, this situation in which we are constantly listened to, um, yet, um, really have um, diminishing power um, as um, a population um, over um, our, um, our 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 government, our you know policy, and our our workplaces, and really our everyday lives. Um, I felt it was really um, um, I felt it was really worth worth taking a look. Um, the focus group um, it has um, has been a particularly enduring way. Um, to find out how we think and feel about things, um, because um, it channels many of the um, things that we quite like to do. We like to talk with other people. We um, we like to do it face to face, um, and we like to um, work. We we like to work together. We I mean, human beings um, can be very communal and cooperative um, most of the time. Um, in in the uh, in the focus group. Um, these impulses have been used um, to um, sell us things, mostly things we don't really need, um, you know, and um, and often um, politics that are, is quite cynical and against our interests. But the um, the the impulses that uh, we channel when we participate in such things um, are, um, are 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 worth examining and holding on to. So you talk about these impulses that we channel, and I think. In many ways, that points to some of the origins of focus groups in uh, in Vienna and in the like late 1930s in the United States, um, and a lot of the movements that were going on at that time. I was wondering if you could talk about that and maybe some of the elements. So it, it seems almost paradoxical that something that yeah. so serves consumer capitalism could have its origins there. Yes. So you picked up on uh, one of the contradictions of this story that I find most interesting um, personally. Um, um, the um, so the, the so you know the focus group has now become almost um, a, a, a a shorthand for the vacuity of our capitalist consumer culture. You know, it's common to hear people say, "Oh, that came right out of a focus group," and what they mean is, you know, some stupid product of corporate America. Um, but um, but it, but in fact, the culture of consultation um, does have its roots um, in um, um, in something much more idealistic. Um, th so the um, um, in um, in the 1920s, um, in um, in Vienna, Austria, um, the there was a brief moment, um, which is now referred to as municipal socialism, um, in which um, social um, democratic socialists um, took power um, in that city um, through elections, democratically, as the name <laughs> conveys, um, and um, and. It was it was for Austrians not only an experiment with socialism but also democracy. Um, they, um, they they had they had not 
um, lived under this form of government very much. Um, and they quickly discovered that they were, um, that the democratic socialists came from the intelligentsia, from, from, the, uh, from the elites, um, not like, you know, what Bernie Sanders would now call the billionaire class, <laughs> you know, that would be, but like they were, they, they were shrinks, they were artists, they were intellectuals, you know, I mean, you know, they were, um, um, and, um, and they were, um, they were political activists. Um, they, um, but they were not, they were not by and large from the working class. Um, and they quickly discovered that, um, that to get the, um, the masses to go along with their ideas, um, they needed to learn a lot more about how those masses um, thought and felt about things. Um, so, and they had a lot of, um, actually for socialists to, uh, today, I think would be a little surprised um, how socially conservative a lot of um, the, Vien the Viennese um, ideas were. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, they, they really wanted the working class to um, change its behavior, um, to change its lifestyle in everyday life. Um, so, um, and they had a very specific vision of what sort of person was going to be suited to democratic socialism. Um, they felt that um, that you know the working class should drink less, maybe not drink alcohol at all, um, that um, abstain from sex outside of marriage, play team sports, um, listen to opera rather than to soap operas. Um, and while the working class was pretty sympathetic to the Viennese socialist um, like ideas of economic equality, they weren't very interested in this agenda, like this, this you know, um, basically um, have less fun and be healthier, you know? Um, so, um, they, um, so, so this was a, um, um, so, so things like this were frequent wake up calls for the Viennese socialist um, intellectuals. Um, and um, and they, um, they worked with a lot of qualitative methods, that is, um, me um, methods of surveying people that involved listening to what they had to say. Um, and, um, um, and the focus group comes out of those efforts. As um, Paul Lazarsfeld, who later is, who is now kind of recognized as one of the fathers of the focus group, um, said about that period in Vienna, he said, we had to, we were trying to find out why our propaganda was unsuccessful. Is that how he summed it up. And then, um, so Paul Lazarsfeld was partially or, or mainly responsible as well for bringing the focus group to the United States uh, in, in 1933. Um, was, why do, why do you think he found such, uh, such fertile ground for that, um, for I guess the methods that he had been working on uh, in, in, in the decades leading up to that in, in the US? Yeah, well, it's one of those, I mean, and um, you know, you must, um, as, a, as a public historian yourself, um, um, confront this all the time, these, these sort of um, se um, seemingly um, amazing um, mergers between the perfect person and the perfect historical circumstances, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so like he's, he's such a, um, while, um, while very idealistic as a socialist, He's also such a hustler, like mm -hmm. Paul Lazarsfeld, and he's and he's really um, he's really interested in um, um, in in drumming up business. He has a real entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so he comes from um, he 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 has to leave. You know the um, the the Viennese socialist experiment was short lived, um, um, and, um, because um, um, a right wing government. Um, d um, takes over in Austria and crushes them. Um, but, the, and then actually um, 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 a, shortly after that, um, the Nazis um, come to power and um, Lazarsfeld has to leave Europe because um, he's not only socialist, but also Jewish. Um, so he comes to the United States um, and, um, and he and at your your phrase fertile ground is is perfect. He finds this very fertile ground um, for um, the the kind of qualitative research um, that he's been doing. Um, first of all, um, he um, he gets involved with early radio research efforts. 
um, and um, because um, radio is a relatively new industry, and um, and and people are really realizing that um, that you know they don't know very much about the listeners and what they want to hear. Um, quickly, though, in um, he he comes to Columbia. He starts up um, a um, institute called the Bureau of Applied Social Research. Um, and um, that applied is super important. They are not doing um, they're not doing purely academic um, sociology. They are taking on um, contracts initially from the government um, in order to um, um, in in order um, to, um, to, um, to to further their research to be able mm -hmm. to do the kind of research they want to do. So they're, um, the, um, they um, they take on contracts with the Roosevelt administration, um, which is trying to, um, much like the Viennese socialists, um, trying to understand why its propaganda is unsuccessful. Um, the FDR government, um, um, it wants to um, enter World War II um, um, and, um, and, you know, join um, the European allies um, in fighting Hitler. Um, the U.S., we now re re regard that as a fairly um, uncontroversial um, U.S. intervention, um, but actually the, um, the general public at the time was quite reluctant um, to make the sacrifices, um, both the human sacrifices and, and the material sacrifices. You know, there were, there were um, all kinds of, um, um, there were all kinds of hardships that people were going to um, face by the U.S. entering this, this conflict. Um, people were unconvinced. So the, um, so, so, so Lazarsfeld's qualitative methods come in handy. Um, and he very much sees this as politically, on a, the FDR government is politically on a continuum with democratic socialist Red Vienna, which is kind of interesting because as, a, I mean, we as Americans and people doing history would look at those um, things as pretty different now. Um, but, um, but, but, but to Lazarus felt, he felt like, you know, this is great. You know, I was fighting for democratic socialism and here it is. <laughs> you know, like he was convinced that FDR was going to build that. Um, and, um, and so, um, so, so, so they, so they, 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 they experiment with um, um, different with radio broadcasts and playing them for um, for 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 people. Um, what they find is pretty useful. Um, what they find is um, the the tendency of the government um, um, broadcasters was to emphasize uh, how terrifying the Nazis were. Um, how dangerous, how bloodthirsty, how almost inhuman, reptilian, they're like merciless to civilians, particularly merciless to civilians. Um, that was actually for Americans really scary. And people thought, you know, maybe we should just leave these people alone. Like maybe we shouldn't get involved in fighting them if they're, you know, really that, um, if, if, if they're really such, uh, such monsters. Um, so the um, so 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 the these kinds of reactions were were very valuable, mm -hmm. um, and um, and the um, and the government was able to shift gears um, in response to Lazarsfeld's um, um, groups and um, and um, and produce broadcasts that instead emphasized um, the positive, like we're a great democracy, we need to save our way of life. Um, actually, a lot of the kind of propaganda that has persisted today, I mean, you know, we, you sometimes still hear, um, you know, American governments saying things like that, you know, we need to, uh, we need to preserve our way of life. Um, and, um, and at that, um, th in this moment, in this process, um, the, um, the um, Lazarsfeld's emphasis on groups, um, on, um, on testing people's reactions to a very specific text, to centering a discussion around that, um, it's in this moment that um, well, we usually, uh, most people consider the focus group to have emerged. And you talk, it's interesting you talk about how the, the like the FDR kind of New Deal um, 
government had similarities with the, the, the democratic socialism of, or socialist democrat uh, of uh, Paul Ezersfeld and how he felt somewhat comfortable um, working within that realm. But then that begins to change after World War II with the right. rise of corporations and their need to sell products to the American people and the use of the focus group within that. Um, so how did, how did so many or, uh, previously uh, people with progressive ideas find themselves working for uh, these new corporations for this in the service of this uh, con consumer capitalism that was emerging? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in some ways, the um, um, though, um, you know, a, as a, a democratic socialist myself, I, I understand um, like, um, why he was comfortable with both with with those projects. Um, but 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 one thing that um, that um, all those situations have in common is the need for an out of touch elite to um, reach the rest of the public, you know. So I mean, it's just you know for different ends, right? You know that. Um, so so that's and that's really um, where we. I, I mean, to me, that is the um, the consistent historical explanation for focus groups is that um, they um, they are when they are how they emerge and how they and when they ever they continue to be used um it is because um, uh, um th there there is an elite that is out of touch and needs to hear from people um right. that said i love the i i i loved trying to figure out um the, the very question that you're asking how did lazarsfeld um, square his socialist ideals um with um with what happens next so what happens next is um, at the end of World War II, Madison Avenue, um, co corporate America has a tremendous um, need to um, continue uh, making profits um, because of the wartime industries have, have dried up. And um, Americans have become very used to austerity and to consuming very little. So they need to convince um, these um, the, these these now very sacrificing buttoned up people to begin <laughs> consuming again, and um, and they also um, need to replace all the lost market share of the um, of the wartime industries. So there's a great need for marketing and persuasion, um, and um, um, and and this um, simultaneously. Uh, fulfills an urgent material need for Paul Lazarsfeld's institute, which is which has also lost the government as a big as a major contractor because the government has no more need um, of its particular services. Um, so, um, so basically, um, corporate America and Lazarsfeld's little corner of academia um, need each other right now um, in in this in this period. Um, so I, I mean, the, the Lazarsfeld was very defensive about this. Um, in um, I mean, he was dead, so I was not able to talk with him. <laughs> Problem. I imagine you run into a lot on this podcast. Um, but um, but in um, in the the records, I was able to read the oral histories, the the interview uh, the interviews that people had done with him when he was alive. Um, um, in um, in the archives at Columbia. Um, you know, he was very defensive about it. Um, at one point, at one in, to one interviewer, he said, "I can still sing any damn worker's song," <laughs> you know, which is just a very like, you know, he he felt a little bit bad, like he was sensitive to to charges that he'd sold out. But um, but what uh, what really comes out um, when you um, read Ra Lazarsfeld's own words um, in how um, how he tried to yeah how he talked about it, um, he was really um, enjoyed um, the hustle of corporate America. Like he may not have really like believed in it ideologically, but he felt it was fun, you know, to to try to sell things, you know, and to try to figure out how to sell things and to try to figure out how to um, sell his little academic um, research institute to big corporate players and and, and get these big contracts. Um, he um, he um, he said he he would often say it's a really good game. 
Um, and, um, you know, and you can only um, psychoanalyze people who are dead so much, um, as I, I'm sure you also <laughs> encountered this a lot on your podcast. Um, but, um, but he had also, he also often talked about um, his own father had been very, in Vienna, had been very unsuccessful in business um, and and in and professionally and um, and Lazarsfeld um, may have um, may have always had kind of a desire to um, to to succeed in a capitalist um, way you know not so much money it's not like he made a ton of money but just um, to be good at that you know like it's to, you know to be able to play the game so he's a very um, interesting and contradictory figure and just the right figure to bring the focus group into the post-war um, um, consumer culture. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think, I guess it's sort of a tangential question uh, to, what, to what we were just talking about, but do you see the focus group as being a distinctly American phenomenon, um, historically and just in terms of the, the society that began to emerge after World War II? I mean, why in the US could it have existed anywhere else? Um. So it's actually really not. Um, very interestingly, um, it develops um, almost in parallel um, in England. Um, so, um, so, 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 the, um, so at almost the same time um, in the mid century, um, the Labour Party, um, the, which is the British at that time, was British Social Democratic mm -hmm. Party still kind of is, um, but you know if that's a longer <laughs> conversation. Um, the um, um, realizes that um, it is losing the support of working class um, voters, and they don't know why. So it's an again, it's like a similar history. Again, a social democratic context of you know really sort of having ideals that would ostensibly um, seem to benefit the masses, but um, an elite that has has grown has lost touch. Um, so, 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 so in Britain, the focus group develops um, a, a, as well, um, more or less at the same time. So that's very interesting. Right. Um, there are um, some particularly, um, and I would also say that in some ways, um, it makes sense for it to have. Um, developed um, out of a European context because um, in those early years, um, researchers were very um, um, influenced um, by um, by um, psychoanalysis um, and you know ha and sort of ways of ways of listening to people that that field was developing and ways of thinking about what people might mean under the surface that they were not stating, you know, and, and that whole way of thinking became um, quite useful. Um, then, but later it does develop in a very um, distinctly American way um, be, because um, we had such a, a um, we had just had such a burgeoning consumer society and such a um, a prosperous middle class um, to to market to um, in the 1950s, um, and um, and so um, it take it and it so it takes on a particularly American character there, and also the way that um, psychoanalysis. Um, changes as it comes to the United States is all um, is also a part of the story, and we see um, we we see the method become somewhat Americanized um, mm. there too. I suppose it's also partially Americanized in terms of our in, in terms of the U.S.'s specific brand of Cold War uh, politics or anti-Soviet um, yeah consumerism. Yeah, it's very. It is very much part of. Um, um, it, it's it, it's sort of. Um, it it sort of becomes a a, kind, a part of the um, anti-Soviet propaganda that um, the, the the rhetoric is um, that um, that consuming is a kind of freedom, and that um, and that the consumer marketplace um, is an extension of democracy. Um, and um, and that um, the United the American system is so much better than the Soviet system um, because um, we can buy all this really great stuff 
um, and we and we we have the freedom to do that. Um, and um, and so the the focus group um, by being um, by being so participatory and um, and something and a way that consumers are listened to um, it amplifies um, that um, that kind of um, propaganda that mid-century Americans um, are getting um, about um, about how participatory and um, and democratic um, consuming is. Mm -hmm. um, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about. Uh, you have a few chapters of the book that talk about uh, the rise of 1960s, 1970s uh, feminist movements and yeah. the role of, uh, I guess the role of culture of consultation within those. And I'm wondering um, to what extent were those movements shaped by the culture of consultation and focus groups and to what extent did, I guess, I guess how did they play off of each other in that time period generally? Yeah, so um, one of the things that um, is, um, is really important is that um, in the mid century, um, you know, most corporate decisions um, are being made by men, um, you know that, and 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 for the most part, um, women are in the cons role of consumers. So the way that consumers are thought of is very feminized um, in this period, um, and the and and decision makers um, and and and, de and decision makers are um, are are mostly men. Whether that's you know the people who make the advertisements, the people who make the products, the people who make decisions about how to market something. Um, and, um, and men are very out of touch with women's lives in this period. Um, and um, and so, um, so that is one of the particular um, emphases of the focus group is that it is an opportunity to hear from women. Um, you know, and so, um, so you know you and you see in the um, in the seventies as second wave feminism becomes um, much more um, visible and um, and militant than um, than past mid century um, women's rights efforts. Um, you see um, the um, you see um, advertising even sometimes um, mentioning um, the um, focus groups in an effort to assure the public we are listening to women. Like there's such a premium in that moment of listening to women because women are taking to the streets and demanding to be listened to. Um, and, but of course, corporate America's approach to that is like, you know, we listen to you about, um, you know, how to make our new car, you know? And so like there, um, the, uh, I, I think um, if the, um, I talk about this in the book. The Ford Motor Company has a yes. uh, has a great ad talking about um, you know this is like um, like like Janet had this great idea of like how we should make the doors you know and uh, you know it's been, and very much sort of giving credit. You asked for this, um, and, um, and 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 that's and that's also um, things like that efforts like that by corporate America are also. Um, um, not only responding to women's broad demand uh, to be listened to, but also to specific criticisms of advertising and of corporate America. Advertising is really pilloried by the second wave mo um, feminist movement um, as being sexist. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, when you first start looking into this history, you're like, wow, oh, they're really obsessed with advertising. But then when you look at the ads, they really were very sexist. <laughs> I mean, and it was yeah. it was definitely um, fair enough. Um, so yeah, so so they're they're really um, um, that so so that so, so in so in that way, um, there's a very um, dynamic relationship between mm -hmm. the feminism and the and the focus group in this period. On the other hand, there's also a kind of um, um, interesting um, way in which the culture of consultation um, um, really um, tends to permeate the whole culture um, by this time, um, including um, the new left and feminism. Um, so that, uh, you know, even our protest culture starts to reflect it. Um, and, um, and, and I think um, in, in many ways, um, I mean, so, so for instance, 
consciousness raising groups. Um, you know, pe or, you know, people, you know, people are people are gathering in groups um, to give voice um, to their feelings and to their ideas. And um, and 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 in this, you know, in this period, the the, the focus group just really flourishes. Um, and I, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that that groups were just so pervasive, um, you know, and in including in in protest culture, um, and in some ways, um, some some observers have criticized um, the protest culture of this period um, for um, um, for emphasizing talking in groups so much, um, you know, and 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 to sort of um, and the emphasis on giving voice. Um, as opposed to um, other um, other political um, concerns, um, you know, Rus Russell Jacoby criticized the new, the new left in this period for um, endless talk, um, mm -hmm. um, and you know you can very much see that that endless talk as being um, a part of the influence of the culture of consultation, or that they're influencing each other. Like it's a two way influence; they're mm -hmm. reinforcing each other. Mm -hmm. And you see that sort of continuing at the, you discuss Occupy Wall Street a little bit. Um, yeah. And the, the, the giving each other the mic or uh, the, the eight hour long meetings having to do with, with feelings, although that yeah. wasn't entirely what, what the movement. Yeah, cer certainly not. It, it was certainly <laughs> not limited to, um, to people talking about their feelings. They were yes, very yeah. much um, th um, thinking about, um, you know, a, a structural critique of uh, mm -hmm. American capitalism, but in practice, there certainly was a lot of emphasis uh, on giving voice and it was in a way the primary action. You know, when you went down to um, Zuccotti Park, um, you know, people were, um, people were um, speaking, you know, and people were, people were, would, would, um, there was a, um, um, a, the people's mic was a, a way in which, um, you know, people would, um, you know, so somebody would speak and people would echo um, what that person had said in order to amplify it. Um, and, um, and that is very a very beautiful thing to witness and to participate in. I, I don't want to minimize it, but on the other hand, um, you can also see it as a kind of culmination of the influence of the of the culture of consultation on protest right. culture. Mm. Yeah, it kind of it speaks to what I saw as one of the central tensions of the book, which was between this idea of being heard or of listening as sort of a placeholder for. Uh, actually taking power or actually wielding power. That's um, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that that's a, that's absolutely right. And mm -hmm. and that um you know the 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 culture of consultation, the the feeling of giving voice and being heard um, is very um, invigorating and often pleasurable um, but it's also um, easy to um, get um, distracted by it. It mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily um, bring people closer to wielding power. And um, so a few minutes ago, you touched on the Ford Edsel, uh, which is, I think, maybe my favorite chapter from the book, or definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one thing that particularly interested me about that is the way that it seemed to, it seemed to link to a, which was another theme of the book, which is so, the sort of process of myth making around uh, focus groups, um, as employed by by political groups as well as corporations. Um, and this idea that corporations or the Ford Company loved this idea that uh, that the consultation of consumers or the focus group was responsible for the failure of the Edsel, uh, because it it crowned this kind of this myth of uh, the consumer is king. Um, exactly. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering if there's a, because it does, this this idea does crop up a few times in the book, if there is a coherent strain of maybe tied into the great men of history, mythology, or, or, or if there's a kind of coherent process that's linked together of myth-making throughout, throughout the 20th century in the U.S. Yeah, um, well, I, I, I do, I do think that there is, I mean, it, it's, um, the, so, so the, yeah, the, the Edsel story was, was fascinating to me for exactly the reasons that you said, um, that, um, that the, um, um, the, the reasons for the, the reasons for, for the failure of that car, um, 
um, actually um, didn't have anything to do um, with um, the with the consumers or with the consumer research. Um, you know that was um, you know, that was actually um, like known and understood at the time. Has been um, you know well. Um, documented by um, subsequent business historians, even recently, um, and um, and and yet um, the um, the 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 company's um, line on it, um, which is you know that it was um, you know our, our our consumer research was bad and misled us, um, and um, it turns out you know. You know, you know, you people are just not so simple. You can't be, you know, the folks just can't be um, captured by um, um, market research, and um, you know, and um, and you know, it's sort of a um, um, like a a kind of knowing, like we're just, you know, we're just your slaves. We we corporate America mm -hmm. are just working for you. You know, you're the you, like you're in charge. You know, um, and um, and and it was it it was a sort of really um, like wonderful moment in Cold War propaganda. Um, and yet the 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 corporation's version of that story has really persisted in popular culture. Like we still, um, we we, st we still hear, hear people say in the business world and on business blogs and in, you know, the business press, like all the time, like oh, you know, well, if you do focus groups, you just end up with another Edsel. Like it's really exact, like the like the Ford Motor Company's version of events, um, though it's been debunked many times, has really persisted, and I think that that's pretty um, fascinating too. <laughs> Um, so uh, as far as like, sort of the consistency of myth making, one thing that's so interesting about that um, is that um, um, is that we've seen different versions of that pop up again and again. Um, and um, and I think one of the reasons is, um, I mean, it it pleases both sides, right? I mean, the corporate the corporate elites um, like um, love the idea that um, the people are at fault instead of them when something goes wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like, well, that's convenient. Like we, instead of taking responsibility, we'll blame people, you know, we'll just say it's, you know, people people just like you, like screwed up. Um, and um, and so it's, it's, con it's convenient on that level um, as well as having an ideological um, resonance. Um, but it also um, is something that, um, we the people kind of enjoy believing like we're so powerful like we did that you know and you know sometimes we screw up but you know they're really listening to us and we're kind of driving this train so it's a bit um of a i think these myths around the focus group um you know even these these myths um you know making the focus group seem more stupid than it is um have an oddly comforting um resonance which is why they 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 recur um for example in the new coke situation you know which um and um, the failure of uh, um the launch of new coke and its failure uh, was also blamed on focus groups um and uh, another um um another um interpretation which seems to have equally little basis and um, yet has been equally persistent. Mm -hmm. And there's another manifestation of that myth-making uh, that you talk about in, in Steve Jobs um, mm -hmm. in that example, but it's, 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 it's a slightly different example of it because mm -hmm. I guess it plays into this whole great man, uh, you talk about the, the American entrepreneur um, and this sort of mythology around that, and uh, how it seems on the surface or to some people to be an example of of the greatness of one mind and of uh, the 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 way in which focus groups aren't really all that dependable. But you talk about how it actually speaks to the power of of horizontality and of uh, of consultation. Um, and I think I actually want to end on on this because you talk about it as a way. That that perhaps we could look forward um, to to another way of doing things and to another way of of, of using the processes of the focus group uh, to actually put power back in the hands of of the common people or out of the hands of the elite. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, so 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 after um, so after 
um, sometime after New Coke in the 90s and early 2000s, um, a new um, form of um, focus group myth-making emerges, um, a new way of beating up on the focus group emerges. <laughs> this, this, this form has persisted, but one of the things that has persisted the most is um, people's hatred of it. Um, and, um, and, um, and, and this time, um, the, um, the, 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 the mythology really um, um, uh, centers around, as, as you suggest, the idea that um, that you know good good decisions um, d don't come from focus groups. De um, good decisions and good ideas come from um, great people, in and and in, in in most cases great men, like and and like really rich men <laughs> generally. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so so you know you have. Um, um, and 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 you, you, so you have versions of this in the political realm. You have um, um, conservative politicians like both both George Bush's, you know, is like denigrating focus groups, you know, because they are the ones making the decisions, you know, and um, and you know that it, it's sort of um, um, a, a point of pride for them, um, though not true. They did listen to focus groups, but it was an important posture for them to say they didn't. Um, and um, and and in the in the business realm, um, you have um, Steve Jobs is the um, the, um, the 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 version of that. Um, and um, Steve Jobs is um, is always um, always said in interviews, we don't use focus groups. Um, you know, I don't believe anything um, anything innovative comes comes out of that. Um, and um, and it's interesting because when you um, so that's and that's always received as a, a sign of Steve Jobs' genius and a sign of you know that, that what is was so smart about Apple was that Steve Jobs just you know um, it came up with great ideas and got people to implement them because you know he was um, such a rich genius mm -hmm. um, and um, and so um, but. You know, um, as is the, usually the case with these kinds of um, per, um, pervasive popular myths, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and actually, when you look at um, um, Steve Jobs's um, Apple, um, it, that that company, um, there, there's a there's a lot of horizontality there. Um, and there's a lot of listening there um, that. Um, you know they um, they may not be conducting market research, but um, they're um, but the employees themselves are very collaborative. They're um, um, they're they're really um, thinking about the way they use technology, what they would like to see um, in technology. They're not putting a lot of distance um, conceptually between themselves and the consumer. They're thinking. Uh, you know, I would really like to listen to music on my phone, you know, and kind of imagining that other people might feel the same way, you know, I mean, and, and so, so in, instead of sort of thinking from on high, what might these little people want, you know, um, and, um, and, um, and, and the process um, by, by which they work um, is, is also um, very, um, very collaborative, very horizontal. Um, I don't want to idealize it. I have, of course, of course, I have also um, um, read and heard that Steve Jobs was uh, an asshole. I don't doubt that. Um, but um, but this but the the structure of the workplace was not one of great genius just gives directions and peons carry it out. Um, it was um, it w was much more um, 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 cooperative than that. Um, and so, in some ways, you could almost look um, at um, at Steve Jobs's Apple um, as being um, something more horizontal and cooperative than a focus group, um, rather than an advertisement for um, you know just listen to um, rich geniuses. Mm -hmm. Great. Um... I guess is there is there anything else that you wanted to say? Maybe especially uh, having to do with with what this tells us about where we are now and um, how how the, how the how the culture of consultation has has manifested now with regard to social media, et cetera. And I think you bring up a few good points about um, 
the focus group pointing to a way of listening to each other and of uh, maybe reversing some of the processes that have that have that we've discussed occurring throughout the twentieth century. Yeah. So I mean, I I think that in 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 some ways, um, our, in our current media moment is almost the culture of consultation on steroids. Mm -hmm. Right. We're constantly invited to give our opinion. We're constantly give invited um, to. Um, share our feelings um, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, you know, whenever you ride in a cab, you're asked to like, "How did you feel about your cab ride? How do you how do you like your driver?" You know, I mean, everything is just. I mean, everything is the culture of consultation now. Um, and um, so, so in in some sense, like we um, we're um, we're in it more deeply than ever. On the other hand, um, we are. Um, um, we are also in a moment of um, um, of great um, emphasis on participation, on political participation. Like we're really seeing, um, I mean, a, a, like a rise in you know people um, people going out to protest, people joining political organizations, um, you know, people. Um, you know, knocking on doors, you know, to um, you know, talk about, you know, who you should vote for. I mean, and, um, and, you know, these, these kinds of things um, are, um, um, uh, uh, like, suggest that we might be, um, we, we, we might be leaning toward um, rejecting some of the passivity of the culture of consultation. And when you look at our last election, um, certainly one of the most focus group candidates of all time did win the popular vote. So <laughs> it's not going away. And that was Hillary Clinton, by the way. Um, but, um, but on the other hand, you, you also saw in the popularity of the, um, of the two other candidates um, that, um, that rose to prominence that year, both um, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, um, you saw two very interesting um, ways of rejecting the culture of consultation. Trump's was less interesting. Trump's was a traditional authoritarian, um, like I'm the rich man and you should listen to me, rejection of focus groups. Uh, you know, he was, you know, just like, I, I do focus groups right here. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and that's like not much different from the stance that um, other, um, other prominent rich men have taken um, toward the method. Um, Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, um, didn't use them, didn't find them useful. His staff told me, but um, but but didn't make a big performance about it. But yet, constantly emphasized this need for political participation. You know, he would always say, "This campaign is not about me. People have to. You have to get out and um, and be active. You have to." Um, you have to demand that your politicians do these things that um, that we that we've been talking about in this campaign, um, and um, and so um, in in some sense very um, um, very much a um, um, a culture of participation um, that um, that 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 could that could be more um, could be more serious about power. Mm -hmm. Great. Well. That brings us to the present day, which is where a lot of good historical conversations end. That's uh, right. <laughs> so uh, once again, um, our guest is Liza Featherstone. She is the author of Divining Desire, uh, Focus Groups and the Culture of Consultation. Uh, Liza, thanks so much for, for talking to me today. Thank you. It's really a pleasure. Great. Take care. You too.